Good morning, everyone. My name is Katrine Angela Soldejano, your host for today. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Sprout HR and Finance Experts by Sprout Solutions in partnership with UP Los Banos Institute of Mathematics, Science, and Physics. How are you? I'm sure this is a critical time for HR, and so we're here to give you legal and practical advice to help lead your company. By the way, we're live on Facebook. Feel free to share this live webinar. So just to give you a brief introduction to who we are, Sprout is an HR technology company that helps your company take it to the next level in terms of taking care of your people. We provide systems and support for recruitment, timekeeping to payroll, and analytics all in a cloud-based system to enable work from home work for you. And now we hope to be able to lift up your team during this crisis. So while waiting for everyone to tune in, I'd like to introduce the raffle mechanics. Next slide, please. So for our raffle mechanics, well, everyone, you, uh, so our raffle mechanics is that we'll be flashing three keywords during the presentation. So all you have to do is comment these three keywords in our pin post in our Twitter page, which is at Sprout HR Tech. So, so right now for the first, for our first raffle keyword, it's risk. So please prepare your questions for the fireside chat section. Fireside chat session later and ask anything on your mind with regards to the matters concerning our topic today, which is risk management for reopening the workplace during COVID-19. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest guest speaker. He is a professor and scientist at the Institute of Mathematical Science and Physics, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. He holds an appointment as junior associate at Dual Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Chesil, Italy. He is also the chair of the Diploma in Mathematics teaching program at the Faculty of Education of UP, UP Open University. Dr. Rabahante is also one of the ASEAN diplomats, ASEAN science diplomats. So let's welcome Professor Joma Rabahante. Okay, hello. Um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning uh, to those who are in this uh, Zoom uh, webinar and also those who are watching in Facebook. Okay. So uh, thank you for inviting me, Sprout, and I hope I can uh, share my uh, thoughts on uh, somehow help the uh, companies in uh, reopening, especially in this time of pandemic. Okay, um, are you going to share uh, the screen? Or should I? Uh... Okay, so probably uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just uh, share my screen. Okay, what I'm going to, to do today is to give you a, a demo on what we are uh, doing, especially uh, connected, as, uh, connected to the uh, works of the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team. And uh, most of uh, these works that I'm going to show, show you are... Uh, done by my colleagues from the UPLB Biomathematics Initiative and also with some, some of my colleagues from the uh, whole UP system. Okay, so let's start. Okay. So before I do the 
the demonstration of our uh, decision tools. And by the way, our decision tools are free. It's for free. Everyone can uh, use this. Uh, everything is uh, already uh, uploaded in the uh, our website, and I'm going to give you later the link. Okay, so what we're going to, to do now is to discuss two um, decision tools that we have created, especially uh, for modeling uh, COVID-19 uh, dynamics, if ever there will be uh, COVID-19 positive around the workplace. Okay, so the UPLB Applied Mathematics Research Clusters, including my team, the UPLB Biomathematics Initiative, those from the Financial Mathematics and Actuarial Science Research Cluster, and those who uh, are with the Quantitative Management and Decision Science Research Clusters, um, we group each other and uh, created these two uh, decision tools. The first one is the Job Risk Calculator, and the other one is the Workplace Outbreak Microsimulator to help uh, different organizations, whether private or public, or even uh, institutions such as uh, from the academe, uh, universities, uh, classrooms, etc. So many companies have already used our platform, uh, companies in, in Makati and uh, nationwide, and also uh, from uh, international uh, uh, settings. And uh, I think one of the good things with this is this is really our uh, help to the country to, to somehow uh, help in the recovery from this pandemic. Oh, everything is for free. And uh, the link to the platform is uh, shown in your screen. It's here. Um, later, I'm also going to uh, uh, paste this in the Facebook page. So I, I'm in, in the Sprout. Uh, I call this live watch uh, FB live and then I'm going to post there uh, as a comment the, this link so you can uh, uh, check our decision tools. So the first decision tool is the job risk calculator which I'm going to do the demonstration later but for now I'm going to introduce to you this uh, decision tool. So the job risk calculator the goal of this is really to determine the COVID-19 infection risk based on the nature of uh, the job of a certain person. So if you are in the HR department, I think it is very helpful because you would know who are the um, employees who are uh, facing a higher risk of COVID-19 uh, infection, okay? So, and this job risk calculator has two um, sub-platforms. The first one is uh, the list of jobs are already uploaded. We analyzed almost 1,000 jobs. Everything is already uploaded. We have pre-calculated their risk. And uh, what the user of this uh, decision tool uh, must do is just uh, search the, the name of the job. However, we know that uh, even if we have analyzed almost 1,000 jobs, this this calculator cannot represent all of the jobs out there. Okay, so what we did is to have another type of calculator, which is, of course, we call it calculator two, which is an open calculator. And with this one, the user can just uh, check the inputs. We have four inputs here, and then later there will be the over, overall risk score and the risk assessment. Uh, that, that will be shown in the screen. So we have the free calculated ones, just search, and then the other one is this open calculator. And uh, many people have used this open calculator already to see what jobs in their company are facing uh, higher risk of infection. Okay, so that's the first decision tool. The second decision tool is a workplace outbreak simulator. The first one that I've shown you, the job is calculator. The focus there is the individual jobs. But here for the second uh, decision tool, the focus is more on the workplace setting. The whole of, it can be the whole company or the whole building, the whole office, not just individual. So the goal of this workplace outbreak simulator is to determine the outbreak threshold, which I'm going to explain later. What's that? 
the basic reproduction number uh, in that setting in your workplace. And if ever the outbreak is not contained in your workplace, what, what will be the projections in five days, 10 days, up to 30 days in, in your workplace? So we have uh, done this workplace outbreak simulator. You can also download this from the uh, website. Although the workplace outbreak simulator um, was coded in Microsoft Excel using macros. So I'm going to show you later that. Okay. All in all, the, the philosophy, the rationale behind this job risk calculator and workplace uh, micro simulator is that we know not all companies, not all organizations, not all institutions are created equal, which means that the risk of a certain institution or certain job is different with the other workplace. So with this, different companies, different jobs must be uh, analyzed in, in, in terms of their infection risk individually. So the analysis here is risk-based. It's very hard to have an umbrella rule for everyone because we know um, not all are the same. We are unique. And if we impose a, uh, an umbrella rule for everyone, it's either there are some companies who would be sacrificing too much or there are some companies who will be too lax um, so, I mean, there will be uh, uh, most probably tails in the distribution. So here we are proposing risk-based assessment. And also um, connected to the, the risk-based assessment is what controls should be uh, implemented. And uh, our decision tools are already uh, covered in some uh, media, uh, uh, like a in Daniela Bulletin, ABCB, and etc. And you can also find this uh, online. So now uh, I'm going to stop my introduction and go to the uh, demonstration. Okay, so let's start the demonstration. Okay. Okay, first, okay, before I go to the job risk um, calculator itself, let me discuss. Um, the situation in the Philippines. Why we need this? Okay, and it's very important. Um, definitely, the risk uh, of this um, COVID-19, the risk in a certain workplace, depends on the risk in the whole community. Okay? So if a certain community, barangay or municipality, has high prevalence of COVID-19, then because the company is situated in that uh, community, there's also high risk. So if your company is situated in a place with very low prevalence, then also the risk might be low. So before we really go to the um, job risk calculator and workplace micro simulator, we always need to monitor first our um, uh, situation. And we know that um, the epidemics or the outbreak in our country is somehow increasing, okay? Although this is based on reporting, but even by just looking uh, in the cumulative, it's still increasing here. Although not that steep as an exponential increase, but still it's increasing. And uh, as of, as of uh, June 30, we have 30, uh, around 37,500 cases already. And Although, um, one good thing with that is most of the um, status, health status of those who are um, infected are mild. So mostly are mild. So you see the blue one, those are the mild and the light one are the asymptomatic. So that's a good sign that only few people are going to the ICUs and hospitals. But still, we need to be careful that's why we should not be complacent, especially if we open the economy. We should uh, maintain the minimum, minimum health standards. Okay, and uh, if you want to check the age distribution, and we see most of the cases are with the age 30, 25, 30, 
to 39 because probably these are the people going out okay, to go to work, etc. So it's mostly on the interactions. Okay. And um, not just that. I think this is also very important to the workplace because uh, this is based on the on DOH data. Uh, there are some errors here, negative, but uh, it's if we uh, delete those negatives, the distribution almost stays the same. So what is this? This is the average number of days, the, the distribution of the number of days from the symptom onset when the uh, person gets the symptom up to the recovery. Okay. And with this one, it, it is saying that the average number is around 32 days. And if you have an employee uh, getting COVID-19, that person might be absent for a month by just looking at these statistics. So we really need to be careful um, uh, in uh, our uh, daily work. Uh, we need not to be complete. We should not be complacent because if there will be an outbreak in the workplace, then there will be we know um, many people who will be hospitalized or will be quarantined, and there will be disruptions in our uh, uh, daily activities in the workplace. And yep, as I've said, we always need to check the community and to check what places have high. Um, prevalence of the disease. And we know currently there's Metro Manila and of course Cebu. Okay, so um, moving forward, uh, before I, I go, uh, just to give you um, the insight on the reproduction number. So rep the time varying reproduction number currently in the Philippines using date of uh, specimen collection is it's hovering around one. Um, we need to just look at here because the data here is not yet complete. We're still waiting for DOH, but here it's still uh, hovering around one. What, what is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is on the average, a certain person infected by COVID-19 can infect one to two persons. So there could still be, uh, you know, a continuous transmission on the average, and this continuous transmission could... Uh, lead to exponential increase in the number of cases. So we still need to be uh, careful. Okay, so moving forward with our uh, job risk calculator, our main goal. So we have the job risk calculator and I've shown, shown you this one previously. So what you, should, we, uh, what you need to do is just search the name. So let's say I want to search for, uh, let's say messengers. Okay, and we know, um, although even without, um, Calculating, we know that they might be facing high risk because they go to many places. And yes, based on our calculation, the overall risk score of messengers is around 1.62. And if we provide them some level of protection, uh, they still pose uh, high risk around 1.7. Now, what's the meaning of this number? Okay, so in our calculator, we are saying that if the overall risk score is between 0 to 0.5, then you have low risk. 0.5 to 1, moderate risk, and more than 1, that will be high risk. That's why uh, the threshold here is 1. Okay, so the risk assessment for couriers and messengers is high risk. Okay, although of course, um, what we did is we just put some level of protection, but if you increase further the protection of messengers, they use PPE or whatever um, interventions, probably the score here could still be uh, decreased. So um, let's try uh, accountant probably. Okay, accountants, uh, definitely most of the accountants are uh, the uh, back, uh, back end of our uh, operations, mostly inside office, not, there's not much interaction outside. So the overall risk score is less than 0.5. So that's low risk. And if we give them uh, further protection, definitely the risk score will be uh, lower. So this is the, the first calculator, which is pre predeter predetermined. Um,
Okay, now we go to the open calculator. So the open calculator, if your job or you don't agree with the predetermined uh, uh, risk scores for the different jobs in the calculator one, you can use this. So open calculator, what you just need to do is to determine these four factors, the number of encounters per hour. On the average, how many people per hour you are interacting with during your work. So let's say on the average, you know that you interact with five people per hour. Okay, and uh, here we, so, so that we, we have a, a somehow a precise definition of encounter. It means if you encounter a certain person uh, within 30 seconds, it, it's already uh, considered uh, an encounter within a one meter radius. One meter comes from the, the World, Her World, uh, World Health Org Organization um, suggestion of safe space, which, uh, which is beyond one meter. So if the person is within the one meter, so it can be considered as uh, an encounter. Um, but if, let's say, you are encountering a certain person for more than 30 seconds, let's say one minute, so it means that the number of encounters of encounter there is not one but two you need to uh, because one encounter is 30 seconds and another 30 seconds so you have two encounters already even uh, that person is just uh, a single person so let's say um, I put here five number of encounter per R5 worksheet duration how long you work okay how many hours do you work in a day um, you can also include here the transportation, the number of hours you, you uh, travel from your uh, house to your workplace. Or let's say it's eight hours. Crowd density, on the average, how crowded is your work area? For example, in your workplace, uh, the maximum number of persons that can be fitted there is 100 persons. But usually, there are only 25 persons inside the room. So you can compute the crowd density as 25 per 100, which is 25%. Okay, and remember the minimum COVID-19 safe space is four square meter. Why four square meter? One meter in front, one meter at the back, one meter left, and one meter side. So it's around two by two. So it's a minimum, okay? So you can, if you have a certain uh, room, divide that room to four square meters. and from there, you can uh, somehow uh, compute the maximum number of persons that can be fitted inside that room. Okay, so crowd density, uh, let's say the crowd density is 40%. Protection level, um, the protection level is how effective are your uh, equipment or practices inside the workplace. Now for the level of protection, we have included here some rules. Okay, it's, it actually depends on the, on the person, how to compute for the protection. So we have included here, let's say, if you have PPE or you're wearing N95 mask, etc. So there are some point system here. And also I want to, to say this one from uh, CDC that the least effective control is PPE. I mean, it's, PPE is effective, but it's not sustainable in the sense that you need to replace that often. But if you have administrative controls, which means you change how people work, their behavior, if uh, their etiquette, then that is uh, somehow more effective than just giving them PPE. But um, more effective is having engineering controls. If you put some barriers or really engineering um, equipment to really stop the transmission of the virus, then that, that is more effective. But of course, Combining everything will be more effective than just using single uh, control. So with that, you can somehow compute the level of protection. You can just try zero to just see the baseline without protection. But uh, here, if I put 10%, this person with this characteristic is still high risk, so 1.17. Okay, and probably um, that's because uh, the crowd density 40% might be still high or the number of uh, ours, that person is working per day is still high. So we need to, to find certain level that we can say, oh, this person has a decreasing uh, overall risk score or increase the level of protection. So that's for the calculator number two. 
Okay. Now, um, there are many pages here in our calculator and you can browse whatever's in here. Um, that just to show you in the home page, we actually somehow uh, from our analysis um, did some analytics and uh, by industrial sector, what industries have higher, so the x-axis, have higher average, average overall risk score? And of course, um, we know that the, the highest one is those people in the health uh, industry. Okay, so this one. And uh, um, IT, IT is somewhere here, etc. And we also uh, plotted here the, the 1,000 jobs. Okay, the, the size of the bubble is based on the average number of encounter per hour. So, and definitely people with higher average or uh, uh, overall risk score here, as we see, are those in the health sector, like denta, uh, dentist, uh, those uh, in the hospitals, etc. Okay, critical care nurses, and we know that. Um, of course, we also uh, plotted that against the average average monthly income, and we see many people with uh, not so high income, although from it's very diverse from low to high risk. But many high risk people here are within the not so high uh, monthly income. Those with high monthly income, for example, uh, of course, chief CEOs, um, assessors, and uh, Managers, uh, I think pilots are also somewhere here. Yeah, pilots. Um, they have uh, somehow um, not so high as the health sector uh, in terms of risk, but they have higher monthly income and etc. You can just browse everything in here. And um, there's also uh, on the average. Uh, how many people can work from home, um, given that they are in the low risk, moderate risk, high risk. And sadly, most in the high risk, most people really need to work outside their homes, like uh, doctors, okay? They need to go to hospitals. So only few people can work from home. I mean, uh, with the uh, basic uh, assumptions, okay? But of course, if there are some uh, technologies or other strategies, many there, there could be other people here that can work from home. Yes, and but this is the reality. Many people like those going to the to, to the farms, agriculturists, they really need, need to go outside their, their houses. Okay. Yep. And there's another link here, the company outbreak simulator. Um, we cannot yet put the simulator in the in the website because it needs uh, some programming um, uh, efforts. But you can download the Excel file um, in this uh, from this GitHub account, and the simulator is something like this. Okay, um, and uh, before we I go to the simulator, I I I, I wish to to explain you this one. Um, why COVID-19 somehow is very somehow difficult to, to contain is that people who are asymptomatic or of course asymptomatic they have very low viral load definitely they, they have also very low infectiousness but those people who are symptomatic but they are still at the pre-symptomatic stage they, they don't have yet the symptom but later on they're going to have the symptom the peak of their viral shedding, the peak of their infectiousness happens during the pre-symptomatic period. So as you can see, if you have an employee there that has COVID-19, that person could already spread the virus in your workplace, even if uh, that person still has no symptoms because the peak here is the pre-symptomatic stage. Then later on, that person will be symptomatic then, but that person could have already infected many people. Okay, in between zero to five days, it, that person being not quarantined can already infect people. Okay, um, yeah, and I, I go to the, um, the Excel file. Okay, so 
So the Excel file is something like this. So you have here the input, okay, the input, the output, and the decision guide. I think uh, if you're a certain HR, what you can just do is the input and look at the decision guide. But um, the inputs are pretty straightforward in the sense that you just put here how many employees you have, how many office or floors your company has, let's say six floors, and then type here per floor, what's the floor area, how many employees do you have in that uh, office, average interactions among uh, the uh, employees within that office uh, floor, just uh, survey people, how, how, how many times you interact with people. So just type everything here. Um, this one, the average risk is the, uh, uh, this one is dependent on the job risk calculator that I showed you. Um, you can input here individually, but uh, we have already preloaded uh, depending on the industry that you are in, let's say in IT, et cetera. Okay, just click and this will be updated uh, uh, automatically. So no problem with this one. And um, if you have already surveyed your employees using the job risk calculator, you can put here how many employees there are low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. Okay, then that's, uh, I think, pretty straightforward. You can get that data um, in your uh, workplace. Okay, so another one is definitely we can put some interventions. If you have some interventions, let's say with this one, physical distance. If you're imposing physical distance, what's that uh, physical distance? Minimum of one meter and maximum of 10 meters, or you can increase this one. You can make it 10 meters maximum. Is, you can one kilometer, it's okay. Um, and then um, this one is probability of committing to the measure. Uh, what do you think is the probability that your employees will uh, commit in regular sanitizing, wearing a face mask, avoiding crowd places, etc. So you can increase this or decrease this. Um, you can just create, uh, you can do scenario simulations, okay, with this. Now, after doing that, uh, the good thing with this one is you will know uh, uh, if there are people who are go going not to follow your rules. So what would happen? So you will, you will see the scenarios here. So for the output, um, this is a technical output, but I'm going to uh, uh, discuss later the decision guide. So the output here is uh, before you look at the decision guide, you need to click simulate. Okay, simulate. Click simulate. And the good thing here is you can also click if your office is air conditioned or not, because there are differences with the risk if your office is air conditioned or not. Just uh, with this one, click simulate. And um, you can skip everything here because this is too technical. What you can do is just go to the decision guide. After clicking simulate, go to the decision guide. Okay, so decision guide is this one. Okay, first, what will be the output? The output is first the, uh, is the outback threshold. What is the outback threshold? Um, I think it's better to this, I put it here just for you to remember. In, in an epidemics, in an epidemics, um, before you enter the exponential phase, exponential phase means if there's already an outbreak. Uh, many people are uh, being infected. But there's what we call here as the initiation phase or the establishment uh, stage. It means that a certain important case may or may not cause local transmission. So it's very um, erratic here. So preventive measures is very effective if you are still here in the initiation phase. And what we can do is we can compute what we call as the outbreak threshold. And the outbreak threshold, okay, is uh, defined as the number of initial infected individuals, usually they are imported cases, that can start an outbreak with a certain probability. In, in our simulator, we use 90% probability. So let's say it is computed that uh, if 100% of your employees will go to work, given your inputs before, and it says 
the outbreak threshold is 2.47. So if you have three positive cases in your workplace, there is already 90% probability that those three or one of those three could cause the outbreak. Okay, so this is very important to note and to know how many, uh, what's your tolerance? Okay, if, you're, if your tolerance, if you can tolerate 12 people, uh, of course, um, if there are, let's say here, outbreak threshold is 12.76. If you have five cases, somehow, okay, um, there might be still no outbreak. But of course, there's still risk because we are just talking probabilities here. But um, it's not really as high if the number of cases is going near 12. Okay, if you can tolerate that, well, uh, it, it depends on your decision making. But if if you really want to go to the conservative side, you can click the no. You can choose the no outbreak. So only 40% can go to work. Um, for those listening, this this numbers here are just for example are just examples you need to input your company values here okay this is our examples here okay these, these are not for all okay so that is the outbreak threshold if the, the number of cases is still far from the outbreak threshold it means you can have um, a strict preventive measure so that you can prevent the piling up of, of the number of cases Okay, and definitely contact tracing and risk-based testing uh, and cluster-based surveillance of uh, cases are very important uh, in preventing the number of cases to escalate near the outbreak threshold. Now, what is the reproduction number? Based on your inputs, we can also compute the reproduction number. So what is the reproduction number? It is the average number of persons that can be infected directly by an infected person. So let's say I, I am an infected person and the basic reproduction number is two. So on the average, I can infect two persons. And those two persons that I have infected, each one of them can uh, uh, infect a, a, another two persons. So there will be exponential increase there. Um, so if the, basic production, if, if the basic reproduction is more than one, then there's a risk of outbreak. And we know there's a, a risk of outbreak because there's an outbreak threshold. But as we decrease the number of percent of employees going to work, definitely reproduction number will decrease. If the reproduction number is less than one, it's a good sign. It means that there's a lesser risk that outbreak will, will, uh, will arise, will occur. Okay? Because on the average, you can infect less than one person, something like that. Okay, so we can have this. And um, the good thing with knowing the outbreak threshold is you can decide on the preventive side, okay? But let's say, uh, unluckily, you were not able to contain the, the transmission. There's already some local transmission causing an outbreak, okay? Probably the number of, you, you let people, 100% of your employees go to work, and there's four, four cases already, so somehow, it's kind of alarming, then you can go to this next stage. The expected number of infected individuals if COVID-19 is not contained. So assuming 100% of employees are going to work and the, and the number of infected individuals is not contained, so in five days there will be eight, 21, 32, and later on 57 uh, people out of your 100 employees will be already uh, COVID-19 positive. And of course, this is, these are just projections. So um, this is the uh, decision tools that we have uh, created and the, the science behind or, and the mathematics behind the Jabis calculator um, is based on our paper. My, pap my paper called, uh, the co-author is Bill B. B. of uh, UP Manila. We have written that and we have already submitted that to a journal and as soon it will be uh, published in uh, one of the journals of Springer. Um, yeah, so um, for now, um, I think uh, I, uh, my demonstration is, uh, I think, enough. And I think I can uh, give the floor to the people uh, with Sprout for the question and answer. Thank you very much. 
All right. Thank you, Professor Jormar, for your informative inputs. So for today, I'd like to announce the second raffle keyword, which is calculator. Again, our second raffle keyword for today is calculator. So that you'll get to know more about who we are in Sprout, please watch this short video before we move on on the Fireside Chat portion of this event. that video. So now I'd like to, to announce the third raffle keyword. So our last raffle keyword is assessment. Again, our last raffle keyword is assessment. So just to do a recap, the three keywords are risk, calculator, and assessment. So you can join the raffle by following our Sprout Twitter page at Sprout HR Tech and commenting these three keywords on the pin post. Now, the next portion of this event is our fireside chat portion. Please prepare your questions and just type them in the chat box. Again, I'd like to welcome back our speaker, Professor Jomar. For our second panelist, let's welcome Sprout Seasoned Risk Analyst, Reynold Salvador. And for our third panelist, let's welcome Sprout's Legal Counsel and Public Sector Engagement Lead, Attorney Lester Nazarene Up. Ladies and gentlemen, you can start asking your questions by using the Zoom chat. Good morning, uh, Kat, uh, Jomar, and Ray. Um, nice to see Jomar, um, who is my contemporary from UPLB days. <laughs> ah, hello. <laughs> yeah. All right. So for our first question, what is the best action plan when one employee tests positive for COVID-19? Again, what is the best action plan when one employee tests positive for COVID-19? I'd, I'd like to take first crack at that question because my uh, answer will really be on legal compliance. So the first thing that you have to do would be uh, to coordinate with your local government unit or the Barangay uh, Health Emergency Response Team having jurisdiction over the workplace. Um, this would be your initial response uh, to ensure that uh, at the very least your local government unit is able to update their information, their tracking of the COVID cases in the area. And uh, second is you have to isolate. Uh, the rules on uh, workplace prevention and response for COVID-19 are embodied in the DTI DOLE interim guidelines. Uh, we have uh, discussed that in a previous episode of this webinar. Um, so the first after that is you have to isolate uh, the person. Your workplace should have an isolation area and you should be able to bring that person immediately to the nearest um, medical facility for, um, for handling. So if, if the symptoms develop during the work shift uh, at the workplace, then uh, report and isolate. Those are the first two things that you have to do. And then lastly, you would have to update your monthly workplace accident and illness report form, which you have to submit to the DOLE office having jurisdiction over your workplace on or before the 10th day of the following month. Uh, Jomar, Ray? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, uh, just to add with that, uh, before an employee tested positive, of course, they'll be considered already as a COVID-19 probable case uh, once they have the symptoms at the same time they took the test. So uh, while they were, uh, and, uh, while we're waiting for the result, uh, we can already inform the employees or those who had close contact and uh, implement appropriate action before the result comes. So we must be prudent and manage the risk first before the actual result. So it would be much better if we have a prepared action plan, like for example, our recovery plan for such uh, cases, or even though there's no result yet, we can already implement a full sanitation of our workplace and the strict implementation of the health symptom questionnaire. So most of the time, uh, employees, uh, uh, or we require employees or the employees have themselves tested if they have the symptoms. So they already have the symptoms. Uh, if HSQ or health symptom questionnaire is uh, strictly implemented, they won't be allowed to access our workplace. So that's one. But of course, there are uh, instances where, in, for example, first four or five days where they are sim asymptomatic. So maybe we can use that to assess who will who were the close contact of this uh, personnel then and then. So that's also one of the preventive measures or uh, how we can manage the risk una until uh, the final result or we, until we receive the final result. And after we receive the final result, yun yung ano, uh, earlier ni Attorney Lester, what we should do to comply with the government requirements at the same time to manage the yung potential outbreak na din. Okay, I think uh, Lester and Ray already discussed what should be done and I agree with them. Um, yeah, very important in terms of epi epidemiology. Um, of course, for the workplace, they have already discussed the legal side and the protocol side. But uh, in terms of the epidemiology side, um, yeah, even before that person tested positive, na test na siya, it means there's already a risk. And you have the, the company or the LGU should already be doing something uh, around that person. Like, very important contact tracing. Okay. And then uh, 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 Ray uh, discussed uh, uh, the proper sanitation of the workplace, and that's very important. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you, panelists. So for our second question, for employees on teleworking agreement or are working from home, could the company require employees to have a COVID-19 RT-PCR test at their own cost before returning back to work? Again, for employees on teleworking agreement or are working from home, could the company require employees to have a COVID-19 RT-PCR test at their own cost before returning to back re before returning back the office? Yep, I'd like to take that question. Um, the labor, the Department of Labor issued the labor advisory after uh, the DTI Dole interim guidelines were published, and it is very clear there that any cost to testing should be borne by the employer. Um, but uh, before that, my recommendation would be um, go back to the Dole Interim Guidelines. You have to have a workplace policy first. If your workplace policy is to test before allowing uh, personnel to return to the office or to the workplace, then you, na you next have to figure out the budget requirements for it because uh, there are two tests, no? the RT-PCR, which I believe is the gold standard, and uh, um, the other one is the rapid testing, which I, I, I would really want to hear uh, Prof. Jomar's take on the RT-PCR versus rapid testing no? in terms of uh, is there really value? Because to me, as a layperson or a person with no epidemiological or, or scientific background, um, it's, it's very clear that you know, the, the difference is that the reliability of the RT-PCR versus the rapid testing. But beyond that, I, I, what is publicly available, I really don't have an idea. But um, for the question itself, um, uh, regardless of the work from home arrangement or flexible work arrangement, if you require testing as part of your policy, the cost should be borne by the employer. Okay, so, Asigur, I'll, I'll uh, explain first then about the, the RT-PCR and with the antibody testing. Um, definitely, the I don't want to say gold standard, but <laughs> because uh, it's like, but it's, it's the standard uh, of the government and uh, worldwide that we use RT-PCR. And one reason there is the accuracy is quite high. 
compared to antibody testing. And um, I understand some of the companies use antibody testing because there's lots of delay with the results of RT-PCR. Antibody testing is very rapid. In a few hours, already have the, the result, right? Just put your blood there and there's already the result, like a pregnancy, pregnancy test. But the caveat there is the error, the accuracy is very low. There's a high error rate. And um, later, if that person could, will be tested positive with the rapid antibody test, then you cannot uh, still uh, conclude. You need confirmatory test, which is RT-PCR. So somehow for the companies, there's an added cost with that rather than going directly to RT-PCR. And, and another one is, uh, of course, there will be debate on this, but my take here is um, the antibody testing has, uh, could be high false positive and false negative. Uh, don't muna tayo sa false negative because it's too obvious. If that person is false negative and you let that person go to the workplace and <laughs> that person can infect many people because the antibody test says you're negative and actually you're positive. So that person can already infect many persons. So that's one of the risks. But there's another risk with false positive. So some people say, ah, that's false positive, that's okay. But actually that's not okay because if let's say that person tested uh, positive, but actually that person is negative, then there's already a, how we call this, um, a, a cause in terms of, uh, of using the, 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 the talent of that person because that person will be quarantined. And if the RT-PCR will, will come after 14 days, so that person is quarantined for 14 days, but he is actually negative. So there's uh, problems with antibody testing, but um, I respect people who are using that, but still they need to confirm that using RT-PCR. Yeah, over. Thank you. Uh, and also to add to uh, Sir Jomar, uh, last, month, last Thursday, we also have a webinar wherein we have a representative or guest speaker from DOH. So they also raised that the uh, cost effectiveness of rapid tests, or they, may, they prefer the 14 day test compared to the rapid test as to its cost effectiveness. But of course, again, if we require rapid tests or PCR tests, the, uh, the cost should be shouldered or it should be shouldered by the employee, uh, employer. And it, it will be not required. It, is, it should not be required to be shouldered by the employees before they are required to return to work. So again, for cost effectiveness, you can use a 14-day test instead of the rapid test. All right, thank you. So for our next question, after the risk assessment, what efforts should we make to further lessen the risk in our business? Again, after the risk assessment, what efforts should we make to what so what efforts should we make to further lessen the risk in our workplace? Okay, so probably I can uh, start answering that. Um, Hello, did, did we lose Prof. Jomar? I think, uh, yeah, we did. Uh, maybe I can take on that question. So risk assessment, uh, we can use that to guide us what items, what actions or events. I think uh, Prof. Jomar's... Uh... Ayun, hello, sorry. Mukhang ano, magla-launch na yata yung internet namin. Joke <laughs> That's one of the problems working from home. If, if um, I may ask, anyway. Prof. Jomar, you're, you're, in, you're working from Los Banos or in the campus? Um, I'm here in Bay Laguna. Near, ah. near Los Banos. Yes. Yeah. Uh, out, uh, in, 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 in the next in town. Place. Malapit next ka ba sa bakery ng Monay ba eh? Um, medyo. Walking distance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, um, siguro, uh, very quick to answer your question is I've shown you before the different controls, the PPE, then the administrative controls, the engineering controls, and everything there is actually in the uh, DOH IATF interim guidelines, risk-based. So they're already listed there. Some of the suggestions, suggestions na first that there's uh, uh, soap in your uh, uh, hand washing area, etc., and sanitation, etc. So it's it's all there. There there are suggestions how to put 
administrative, especially the engineering controls. So to lower the, the risk. And if you're going to follow what IATF is saying as minimum health standards, especially the physical distancing, wearing of masks, and I think that will really be helpful in uh, minimizing the possible risk of COVID-19. All right, so for our next question, what if the employee is working from home and have been infected with COVID-19, not in the workplace? Do the company need to submit the report to DOLE? Again, what if the employee is working from home and had been infected with COVID-19, not in the workplace? Does the company need to submit a report to DOLE? Um, I'd like to... Um... I'd like to recall the form, no? Because the, the where or the workplace, workplace accident illness report form, it's a template by the DOLE uh, and it contains data fields. And um, you're, you're technically correct, no? Because it happened not in the workplace, but uh, from, uh, from, from a pandemic COVID-19 response perspective, it makes sense to report it even if it did not happen strictly in the workplace because that person is actively employed by your, corp by your organization. So please, um, even if the COVID infection or other illness did not occur in the workplace, the conservative position would be to report it because it helps uh, the government track the data uh, correctly. And of course, this I'm not sure if this is the, the last pandemic we will experience in our lifetime. Hopefully it is, no? but um, I, I posted about this in my social uh, media page that um, what, what really is required of everyone at this point is truthfulness in recording and reporting. Because if, if not for anything, at least future generations will have a more or less accurate picture of what happened with COVID-19. Um, hopefully, you know, it's something for the history books and not something going on in our daily lives. But that's where we are right now. All right. Thank I you. don't have any I answer on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Lester. So, for our next question, will the risk calculator help us point the specific sources of risk? Again, will the risk calculator help us point the specific sources of risk? Um, yeah, for this exact uh, sources of risk, it's very hard to answer that because every day we face many people. Um, what, it, what I can just give is the possible um, factors affecting the risk, not really the source. And uh, there are four factors that I've uh, showed you before, the average number of encounter per hour, and then how long that person is working. It means because that explains the exposure time, and then the crowd density okay, in the workplace. And of course, with the company's simulator, uh, there's the air-conditioned and non-air-conditioned room because we know that uh, the virus can circulate uh, and uh, pile up if the room is very close and there's no good well ventilation, uh, uh, ventilation in, uh, in, in the workplace. And the last one is the level of protection. So um, there are some suggestions up to what level of protections you have, like uh, proper uh, wearing of masks, not, facing, not, not touching your face, etc., hand washing, regular hand washing. So um, those are the factors that really affects uh, the transmission of COVID-19. Um, remember COVID-19, uh, to transmit that, you need person-to-person -person interaction. So these uh, factors are somehow uh, represents that, that type of transmission, person-to-person -person transmission. So. Mm -hmm. All right, for our last question. Is there any moral, legal, or financial liability for modelers or employers if any of their employees are infected in spite of having minimal or large risk? Hello, Kat. Kat, did we lose you? as calculated by the calculator, given employees are infected in spite of having minimal large, minimal or large risk as calculated by the calculator, given that the calculator just estimates a probability. Um, Sigur, I answered uh, 
in the side of the modelers. Like for us, uh, in all of our models, decision tools, we have there the disclaimers that uh, these are models based on assumptions and you should always um, be careful in, in interpreting the results, okay? And of course, all of these are just guides. The company can follow or not follow the recommendations of the models. Um, so the, the burden really is with the company um, if, they're really, if they're going to, to use the, the, the tools or not. But in, uh, on our side as modelers, we, we really tried our best to make the decision tools as scientifically uh, uh, valid by doing peer review. So most of our decision, uh, all of our decision tools are peer reviewed by uh, our colleagues and uh, by the community, especially in the University of the Philippines. And yes, as I told you, we already submitted the, the basis of our models in a journal just to have an international uh, people reviewing our models. But all in all, if you're going to use this in your company, the burden definitely is with the company to follow or not to follow the recommendation. And I think uh, attorney here, <laughs> Lester can answer mo more on the side of the company. Yeah, I, I'd answer more on uh, generic on the legal uh, liability. No? Um, I'd like to preface my answer to the liability question with a quote from Zenaida Zeva, our um, you know, one of the foremost astrologers of our generation. Uh, models are like, you know, the stars. Gabay lamang sila. Meron tayong free will gamitin natin ito. Um, that said, um, you know, models are are not determinants of, it's just like your advice from your lawyer. It's like your advice from your accountant, your priest, your therapist. Um, all of these have to be uh, ultimately the implementation of, of the advice or uh, the recommendations that comes from these professionals is to be implemented by the employer himself or even the individual persons himself. No, um, uh, I, I just realized, uh, Prof. Jomar, that I've actually bookmarked the um, Google, um, the, the data modeling, modeling tool on Google because at the start of the pandemic, when, when you released this on uh, Google Analytics, we were talking about it in the profession because a lot of us um, initially, the legal profession was not considered essential. No, it was when MECQ happened that, um, with the the number of arrests that were made in relation to quarantine violations, suddenly the lawyers became essential. No, so we were wondering from from within our community if uh, there was any risk because, of course, uh, a significant number of lawyers in the Philippine market are older. So they are they are a very at risk population. Also with uh, the judges, the court personnel, a lot of them are already in the league, in the high risk uh, uh, populations for COVID nineteen. So that said, um, liability generally attaches if there is direct causality. So if you are the one who directly caused a particular damage to a person, that's the time that you will incur the liability. So as far as the modelers or the employers are concerned. Um, the, for the modelers, definitely, um, with their disclaimers, and um, let's let's also acknowledge the effort of our uh, of our UP scientists. Uh, I think they're doing this not out of any commercial motivation, but because of the the UP spirit of uh, being scholar ng bayan, scholar para sa bayan. No? I, I've seen so many um, scientists from UP really come out and. Uh, volunteer this information to our government and hopefully it reaches the correct uh, uh, decision makers in our government so that it it really comes to a close note. It, it should be a, like I keep saying on my social media pages, um, you know, COVID-19 yung kalaban, hindi UP. Um, so hopefully it, it falls on the right ears. Um, as to the employer, um, we, please note that the employee compensation fund, the, the work, the, the work place compensation for work-related illnesses, you have to establish the causality. So if the work is the one who directly, which directly caused the infection, for example, you are a hazardous workplace, meaning a hospital um, or a healthcare facility, and you fail to take adequate precautions, then from an ECC perspective, you may be liable. And uh, the illness may be considered workplace related or work related or occupational related, and uh, the ECC will have to compensate the employee accordingly. But as for COVID infections in the workplace, um, 
we ha we are keeping a close eye on ECC issuances. So far, wala pa naman pong uh, specific issuance regarding the compensability of COVID-19 in the workplace. Um, th that's a commitment of the legal department in Sprout. Um, we continuously monitor the issuances of the DOLE if there are any updates on the compensability of COVID-19 in the workplace. Uh, just to add with what uh, Prof. Jomar and Attorney Lester shared, uh, if the probability, because some companies also have their own uh, risk management or modelers to uh, assess and mitigate the risk. And also with regards to this calculator, again, it only provides probability or as, uh, assessment as to how likely the risk will happen at the same time its impact. So of course, what we do is use this as a benchmark to provide appropriate response or controls to mitigate this risk or to minimize it to an acceptable level. Now, if the overall uh, accountable for the implementation of these controls or response would be under the management or the owners or the employers themselves. If uh, in case there are case uh, uh, positive cases or outbreak and these potential cases could have been prevented if appropriate uh, controls were implemented, like for example, strict compliance with the BTI and DOLE interim guidelines and non-compliance of which due to for whatever reason, then maybe the employer or any one who is overall responsible for the implementation of this might be, but of course not yet absolute. But uh, what we want here is that due diligence for the implementation, yes, it's a probability, but at the same time, we are expecting to implement appropriate action, especially if this is required by the government or any government agency, like for example, DOLE and DTI, and as well as the minimum health standard not, and for example, 50% lang kailangan pumasok, then we require all employees na pumasok, then there's an outbreak, then absolutely, or most likely there's a, a potential liability, and it varies from industry to industry. That's also the reason why we create these uh, tools, uh, models to help us or our employers uh, implement appropriate guidance or guidelines as well as appropriate action plans. But of course, this is not absolute probability. We use probability. We can't uh, really forecast what will happen in the future, but this will be enough for us to implement appropriate action depending on the risk appetite of the management. All right, thank you. Our time is up for this panel session. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. And thank you, Attorney Lester, Ray, and Professor Jomar for your inputs. Professor Jomar, as our special guest, we'd like to give our thanks through a certificate of appreciation in the token, which we'll be, we'll be sending afterwards. So now, for the moment we've all been waiting for, I'd like to announce the four raffle winners. So our first winner is Mr. Mark John Lopez. Second is Amor with username at Simple Roma 3. Next is Miss Daisy Balao. And number four is Michelle Hakoladem. Hakodale. Again, our winners is Mark, jo Mark John Lopez, Amor with username Simple Roma 3, Daisy Balao, and Ma Michelle Hakoladale. So. For the winners, please type your email address in the Zoom chat box so that we can send you the GC codes through email. Thank you everyone for your participating. So if you be needing any certificate from attending this event, going to this specific link, it's bit.ly.com, indicate your full name, position, and company. So follow our social media pages and use the hashtag SproutHRExpert to be updated on our event. See you on our next webinar on Tuesday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Jomar. Thank you, thank Great. you. Happy yeah. lunch. <laughs>